five. You can raise your hand. One, two. two. We're on the field in November 1st, 1955 when the plane went down. Okay, we have two up front and you'll hear from them later on. And um, how many of you had family members that you know of that were on the beat fields at the time? There shouldn't be okay. any. Okay, that's fine. I'm getting to know the audience. How many of you have heard of Flight 629 that went down in, in beet fields in Will County? Okay, quite a Recently number of doesn't you. Count, does it? How many of you are so brand new that you haven't heard anything <laughs> and you want to hear more? <laughs> and, <laughs> yay, we've got a mix for everything. I think there'll be a lot for all of you to enjoy today. and. Forgive me, I lost my voice about 10 days ago. Oh, dear. And um, it's maybe two weeks now. It's still on the med, but it's the best it's been in two weeks before the trip came. So that's why the microphone. And I wear reading glasses, so. Welcome to our world. <laughs> <laughs> already I'm very <laughs> informal the, um, the talk will be quite serious and touching and inspirational but I do like humor but this is such a serious thing so uh, but if I crack a joke it'll be on me or something okay <laughs> but I love the relaxed atmosphere here I just love Coloradians I'm from Ohio born and raised out east Pennsylvania and uh, rest of my life in Ohio so, I'm going to get started here. In every mass shooting or violent crime, media attention has always focused on the, on the crime and the criminal. And the victims are kind of pushed aside, mm -hmm. and the families of the victims are really are the ones that are totally ignored and left to pick up the pieces of their shattered lives. And I would like to see that change. I think it's beginning to change in our culture. I would like to see it change, but everyone gets affected and it impacts everyone. Economically and emotionally, their lives, the families of the victims, their lives are forever changed and the ripple effects of trauma are felt for a lifetime. Likewise, the communities in which such atrocities have happened, unfortunately in Colorado, there's been Aurora, Columbine, and Flight 629 among some, and the communities are forever changed also by these. So let me take you back in time. I'm gonna do a little storytelling it was the day of November 1st, 1955. The weather was very cold that day. It was 32 degree weather and pitch dark because none of this development that you see today was in existence. Uh -huh. It was total rural. There was no electricity and uh, running through the beet fields where the plane landed and um, no phone lines. It was pitch darkness. But on the day of November 1st, the date that changed 44 lives, 41 families, because there are three couples on the plane, entire communities, it also changed history, and it also changed the nation, and changed so many things with the FBI, with uh, media covering things, but uh, that's a little more detail, I won't go into that now, but it changed everything November 1st 1955 that's why it's so important to remember it and to pass that's John it changed my mother my sister and me forever it also changed Well County in a quiet rural farming community in Colorado life also would never be the same for many many hundreds of the families and what we're talking about is the section we're talking about where the predominant part of the plane blew up over was um, Route 66 to the north, 13 are Colorado Boulevard to the south, 28 
Ronald Reagan Highway over east to west, and then 11 up north south again, and it equal to about one square mile. Uh, Conrad corrected me one time, but it's 640 square acres is what we're talking about. I tried getting a map of it up there for you to see exactly where it was positioned between Firestone and Mead. At the time, the property, well, I believe, was unincorporated, but, but it was closer to Mead. It was considered Mead at the time. Since then, Firestone annexed it in recent years. But on November 1st, 1955, the farmers spent all day harvesting the beets. And there were predominantly four families that each um, farmed 160 acres, square acres. And they were harvesting the beets. It was the beet harvest time. And um, early evening, the big harvesting equipment was just taken off the fields. Satisfied, the, re the farmers returned to their homes to settle in for the night. Businesses like Johnson's Corner up the way carried out their daily routines. They served their customers, they pumped their, their gas tanks. It was a normal, average day. Customers were coming in and out. Children went to school. In the dinner hour, families gathered around the table. Children did their nightly chores, which they used to do then. I don't know if they do them now today, but uh, they did back then, and their homework. So they were all settled in. Each family would have been carrying on everyday routines and it was normal. The same day, clear across the country, on the East Coast in Natfield, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Philadelphia, Martha Hopgood, our mother, stood at five feet tall, six months pregnant with me, and waddling, and she took her husband, our dad, Marion Pierce Hopgood, to the airport as he was heading on a business trip from Philadelphia to Oregon. At the time, he was working with Philco in radar technology, and um, Philco knew my mom was pregnant. My dad had just come back from a three week long trip in August, and um, they almost sent another person on this trip but they opted to send their dad so my mom he did take a taxi to the airport that day um, my mom took him she had sitters watch Nancy so that she didn't have a little taller 15 month old toddling along and off they went to the airport as she was used to doing a waving goodbye to my dad the plane landed in New York where he boarded the mainliner Denver United Airlines Flight 629 for the West Coast. The mainliner Denver, as his flight was dubbed, traveled from New York to Chicago to Denver to Portland to Seattle. Marion called Hobby, that's his nickname my mom had for him, would get off at Portland and wouldn't be home for weeks. My mother. I heard her story for the first time when I was age 42. Can you believe that? I never heard it. We knew our dad died. We knew what had happened, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, but I heard her story for the first time, and that's why I'm here today and why I could write my book. She told me quite a bit when I was age 42. She um, was tired that day. And um, she told me she was very restless with Hobby going, our dad going on this business trip, but she didn't know why. She just had a very foreboding spirit gnawing at her. You know, and back then, Hobby couldn't argue with his bosses. If Philco said go, you went. So that's what he did. <laughs> so besides that, all was normal. Wouldn't you think? You know, both. Both communities were doing their thing, and my mom was doing her thing. Well, Flight 629 landed from Chicago to Denver and was 20 minutes late. But the flight finally took off at 6.52 p.m. from the old Stapleton Airport. 11 minutes later, 
7.03 p.m. Mountain Time, all would change as a plane was destroyed mid-air after takeoff. The air traffic controllers at Stapleton saw two bright lights falling from the sky and soon by process of trying to radar all the radio all the planes that took off. It was deducted that it was flight 629 that went down. People, it has been recorded, people saw it as far as 20 mile radius. The blast was uh, described as being like a rocket blast exploding and lighting up the entire sky in, in, in Weld County. I heard one report from a local man who was five years old at the time. He's not here today with us, he couldn't come. But he remembers very vivid, vividly, he said, Marin, the whole sky, not, not just part of it, not just like a burst, like you see satellites in the sky, huge, massive, all around, the whole sky lit up. The farmers and their families were the first on the fields to see what happened. Just as discovered that it was a passenger plane that fell, not a cargo plane. Soon after, hundreds of everyday citizens gathered in a massive search and rescue. Everyone came pouring out. All the land around that 66, well, I told you that whole square, people came pouring out to see what happened. And when they saw what happened, they all pitched in. And, and um, I used to, from some reports, I heard it was about 200 people, ordinary, everyday citizens like you and me, teenagers, farmers, a baseball team, but their tournament and came out from Greeley. Um, American Legion uh, came out. Veterans would have been on the floor. You name it, everybody, anyone rushed to the fields to pitch in. I'm, I'm just not going to be too detailed because I'll be here forever. Conrad knows the details. But um, um, I want to paint a picture. They all came out. And what they encountered resembled a war zone. There is plain debris everywhere. There are fires. There are craters 16 feet deep. And if you have time, there is an original um, magazine article from a detective magazine from 1955. Mm. That is the first and only picture I've ever seen of the craters. So you might want to go up and take a look at it. And the craters were guarded off for about four or five years afterwards. They were huge, right smack in the middle of the freshly harvested beet fields. And those farmers were the first ones pretty much on the field because they farmed around the land they encountered horror and they encountered human carnage. I could spend this entire time, as I said, discussing this because I've heard a lot of stories since visiting and they're just too numerous for one talk to talk about. But I'll give some examples real, real briefly. We have Conrad Hop here and I'll bring him up later on at the end but he was really the first on the fields, 18 years old, with his soon-to-be wife-to-be Martha. <laughs> they were dating at the time. 18 year old <laughs> on the field, finding dead bodies, mutilated. <laughs> in the pitch dark. And they had to do what they had to do. They, um, when they found a body, they covered the body, and then Conrad would drive his car around the bodies to mark the bodies so it was pitch dark. Uh, the farmers and people came, turn on their car lights, their truck lights on the field so they could see. Eventually generators got brought off onto the field. And this is all really probably before the FBI came and the CAB came. Mm -hmm. The FBI from Denver would have been there pretty quickly upon hearing. But it happened, they did not yet know what <coughs> caused the plane to go down, mind you. All they know is that the tail was in one part of the field, and the nose was a mile and a half away, diagonally in the other part. The whole passenger airplane was totally split 
into debris with over 640 acres. Debris was found as far as six square miles away. China plates mayhem <coughs> and fires burning and the bodies. And the worst came to worst, the worst in human nature is that looters, people, because they saw oh. from a while away, people were driving up from Denver from all over. And they had to shield it off from the gawkers and the lookers, and they had to shield it off from the looters who were, who were I hate to say it because it is heartbreaking, mutilating the bodies oh. to get their jewelry oh. Oh. and stealing from their luggage, the wreckage. So this one man who was five years old, it's not here, his father played a key part and he did his part, but at some point an authority gave him a gun and posted his dad at an entrance where cars were wanting to come in instead of a car. Dare comes up here, you tell him to go away. And if not, you have permission to shoot. Mm -hmm. That's how serious it was. So I've just now painted a picture of what was happening in Well County all through the night. So while hundreds of citizens dropped what they were doing to respond to this disaster, mind you, we didn't have FEMA yet. We didn't have any of that. National Guard didn't come on board for two more days later. So it was predominantly the citizens of Well County that did the rescue mission. The uh, Denver police came up to um, help with the looters and protection, but um, they all came up. Johnson's Corner wanted to put a pub in for them. Their manager was the father of the five-year-old I told you about. With He was told with the gun, but he then took his family back when he saw what had happened. Got on the phone, Johnson's Corner, the only truck stopped in the area, called every single supplier. Back then, you knew who your suppliers were. So he was <coughs> Joe the bread man. He, he called Jack the coffee man, you know. He said, get your supplies. Give me all you can bring. Bring them to Johnson's Corner. He called his staff in, and they made sandwiches and lunches, snacks, everything, and ran them onto the fields. Now, they were on the other part of the field because Conrad told me he never saw Johnson's Corner there. <laughs> so he <coughs> never got the lunches. <laughs> but this is what citizens did back then. They did what they could do. The American Legion stepped up to bat, besides their veterans being on the field, I'm sure of it. <laughs> they were uh, recorded in history as running coffee around the clock because they had to work all through the night and even locating bodies happened for a couple days later. So it was massive. But meanwhile, while they were starting to do that, what happened to Marty? What happened to Mar her mother? She had gone to bed early because she was very, very exhausted and tired. And um, so she didn't watch the news at night. At 11 o'clock though that night, two hours later, so Conrad's already on the field for two hours. His brother and father and everyone else. My mom didn't have a clue. But she heard were three pebbles at her window. She woke up. Looked out her window, she saw her OBGYN, her pastor, and her dad's best friend. They somehow all knew each other, and they came there to tell my mom the news. Hmm. So they, mom signals them to go to the front door. She knows it wasn't very good to see these men there. The time they arrived at the front door, her phone rings, and it's her sister in at uh, Tennessee that saw the news and told her what had happened. And my mother's immediately went into shock. Mm -hmm. She let the men in. I guess they were already in, I don't know my scenario, but she ran upstairs. <clears throat> she picked up Nancy, who was only 15 months old, and hugged her and screamed. God level screams. That is what my mom experienced. Her whole life was shattered by this one very evil act, which then they didn't know whether it was malfunctioned by the plane or what it happened. 
But the FBI and the CAB, they, <laughs> all the wealth people there were gathering parts of the plane every day, <coughs> and it was reassembled in the warehouse that United Airlines provided. And it's from there that they discovered it was sabotage. They discovered dynamite, smells of dynamite coming out of Cargo 4. And um, soon after, they caught the man. I'm not going to share his name. He's in the history books. They caught his man. He confessed it. And um, that is what happened here. My mom, though, her whole life was gone. She was 31 years old. Her dad was 31. My mom was pregnant with me. She went into great fear, of course, great grief. And um, I think the day that our dad's funeral happened, November 7th, which was pretty quick afterwards, if you think about it, um, is the day that they discovered it was sabotage. So they went out looking after the killer. And that's kind of the scenario there. So, my mom had to pick up her pieces. She um, thought she was feared losing her house. They had just bought their house. My dad had only lived in it for three months. Oh. A house that they saved up dearly for. And um, her mother died six weeks after I was born. I came prematurely, of course, because of the tremendous grief and loss. And by all her writings and letters she left, um, she agonized quite a bit. How was she going to make it? How was she going to make it? My dad had a side story here, which you can read about. <coughs> My dad uh, was a veteran in World War II and was a Bronze Star. He had a Bronze Star. And ironically, 11 years later, he was bombed in his own country. But, um, my... Um, I'm trying to decide where. Oh, yeah. So he had the VA insurance from World War II. Well, he never signed it over as beneficiary to my mom. Mm. And so guess what? His mom was the beneficiary. And part of my mom's agony was fighting for that beneficiary money so she could raise us two girls. And our grandmother flat out refused. Mm. Flat out refused to hand over the money. So that's part of the agony my mom went through this first two months was figuring that out. So, as you saw, and some of you saw the clip through, and we'll show it at the end of the slide. There's pictures of uh, my sister and I, age four and five, or five and six, and that's to show that life goes on. My mom picked herself up. What happened was her friends rallied around her. She was active in her church, in her Sunday school. All her young adult class came around her, and women made her the maturity, the, the, what, the funeral clothes. Um, and they took care of Nancy around the clock. They carted her probably between a lot of different people so my mom could cope and settle in with what she had to do. And, um, but she was a woman who, when I heard her story for the first time, I'm probably jumping all over the page, I heard her story for the first time, she didn't have a, she raised us without any bitter bone. And the first thing she told me, one of the first things she told me then, was, Mary and I always felt sorry for the killer's wife. Oh. She had someone close to your gal's age, a baby, just like you. That was my mom. And people have asked, how did your mom make it? It was her faith. Her faith that made her through. She couldn't have done it otherwise. She also told me that Nancy and I gave her a reason to live, that she didn't want to live. But she had us. And so our mom then remarried when I was six to a stepdad who never let her talk about our real dad. He was jealous of her. He was the complete opposite of our real dad. He was very controlling, very uh, manipulative. He did not physically abuse us, but he verbally abused us. And we walked on eggshells growing up. It was not an easy life growing up. 
nor was it an easy life for my mom. So I go on because we felt justified because the killer in the court case got the death penalty. So we thought it was fine. I grew up, hey, I got a stepdad. I called him daddy. I was happy, you know. I, uh, I dove into my studies. I went to college. My life was fine uh, because we felt justified that the killer was, was caught and got the death penalty. But it wasn't until I, I, I got married, happily married, and had two kids, but we went through a hard knocks in our early marriage and everything began to crumble with me. This is getting to my personal story of how the trauma, how the link all fit together. And I, my husband was unemployed when everyone else was booming. He kept losing his job, not to his fault, how many would move out of the state, you know, kind of deal. And um, I just couldn't cope. We had death after death after death. Uh, with significant people in our lives. And I finally had a breakdown. They would label me breakdown, I'm sure, if I went to a doctor, but I didn't. Um, but I just really got cold. Our marriage was in crumbles and shambles because of the unemployment. And um, so my whole prayer to God was, I'd like a job for my husband, our marriage restored, and I want to cope better in life. And that began me on a long search and a long journey. And during that search and long journey to figure out why I couldn't cope anymore is when I began to really want to know who my real dad was. Because he was a mystery. I only heard bits and pieces throughout my years growing up. But I really, really wanted to know him, really missed him. So that began a big healing journey that God took me on. And um, during this time, our Uncle Hop was the only living brother of our real dad. He sent me this package in the mail. He didn't know what I was going through. My mom didn't know. But in the package was the Life Magazine article you see there, the Life Magazine, 1955, artifacts from our dad, and other mementos about our dad were in this box. And for once, I felt I had a piece of my dad. And that happened. Um, other things had happened during that time. And God began unraveling me from over 40 years of repressed emotions. And the more I sought God for answers, the more his love descended into my heart, shedding light into the dark places of my soul and breathing life into my very broken heart. The more he showed his love for me, the more I wanted to know my real biological dad, as I said before, I really wanted to know him. I really wished I had him to touch and heal me. And the more I wanted this, the more I really grew to hate the man who killed my dad. I got so angry. It's like I had all this repressed emotions just surface, all this anger, hate, bitterness. And um, because the reality of what that killer did was not only, um, I didn't know about Well County at the time, but because it affected our life so much. <coughs> I began hating him with a passion. Um, as I said, our stepdad really loved us, but he didn't really know how to love us. And uh, my mom, example, my mom always kept two wallets in her purse. As a young adult, I learned that my stepdad didn't pay for our daily expenses at all. But that our dad's social security check kept us fed. Hmm. Now, he had a good job. He's a control, quality control engineer, but he didn't. I also felt very different. I had a different name than from my step. You know, back then, families were intact. So to have a different name for your parents' name, I was an odd man out in school. Mm -hmm. And um, I also remember vividly sitting in my high school history class discussing the issue of capital punishment. This is in the 70s. I kept my mouth shut because I had an entirely different perspective 
on a controversial political debate, and no one knew our history. No one knew at all what had happened. And I just wanted to cry, uh, crawl up in a ball and, and cry in that class, but I couldn't, so I kept silent. So on and on and on, I, um, I had fears growing up because um, I didn't have a loving father to embrace me. Um, I was insecure, shy, timid. Would you believe that? <laughs> I'm not now anymore. I grew up not trusting men. I thought all men would leave me just like my dad. I thought God was far away and distant. He didn't care for me. Um, I said the Lord's Prayer, but I couldn't see God as God the Father. For those who are Christians in the room, I couldn't see him as that. I, I thought my husband would die early at age 31, like my dad. And then when 31 passed, I went, boo, okay, thank you, Jesus. You know, <laughs> he's still alive. I also feared flying. I wanted to fly. I wanted to go overseas to study in France. But, man, I thought that plane was going to go down for sure. But I got over that. So that's how that one, the ripple effect of Charles was telling you about it. It's tentacles just engulfed me in my belief system, what I believed how I thought, how I felt. But God did bring me through, and I credit him because I didn't go to any counselor. I didn't do that. I just sought him, and, and in time, God began revealing to me that all my problems and woes stemmed to the loss of my dad that fateful night, November 1st, 1955. And as the hate and bitterness of my... Um, at least at the killer surfaced. I knew I had to forgive the killer because that's what a Christian does, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to. I didn't want to forgive at all. Uh, he, he stole from us. And I'm looking for a very good quote here. Let's see. This is an excerpt from my book. Looking back, I was like Frodo in the Lord of the Rings trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien, who bore the treacherous heaviness of his mission, the foreboding force of the One Ring. Had Frodo not made it to the Mount Doom, how many of you have watched Lord of the Rings years ago? Yeah, we all know about Frodo and the precious ring, okay? I'm using that analogy because precious, a golem didn't want to give up that precious. <laughs> had, um, had Frodo not made it to Mount Doom and fought Gollum over it, causing both Gollum and the ring to fall in the fire, evil would have embodied Frodo forever. Like the one ring, the pull of my hatred to the man who killed my dad gained strength each day, and the burden of carrying these intense feelings exacted all that was within me, weighing me down with an unbearable heaviness. In that moment, I had a choice to choose life or death, Hanging on to that hate would imprison me forever, bringing death. Choosing life meant doing the impossible. Frodo fought the same choice. So my mission was to completely forgive the murder and the evil ring that held power on me, the hate, the anger, and their companions, bitterness, and resentment. I knew that if I finally didn't come face to face with forgiving him, that I would be forever swallowed up an embittered, hateful person. And so, I didn't want to forgive him. I couldn't forgive him. So I asked God, what do we do? We pray, right? So I asked God for grace. I said, God, I can't do this. Would you help me? And he did. And the day I did, I won't tell you the whole story, it's in my book. <laughs> but the day he did, the freedom that came to me was so life-changing. I've been a Christian all my life. Uh, my husband and I were pastors, well, he was. I was pastor's wife, we had in and out pastoring. We counseled people. <laughs> but here I was face-to-face -face with my own, my own heart. And I was so free, and everything began changing after that. Soon after, my husband got a job. Uh, our marriage got restored. 
My daughter's in the back. She lived through this time period in my life when her mom was a basket case. But see, she made it wholesome, healthy. <laughs> God's grace. But the, um, the terror of what that one man did, and it was so evil, affected not just well counting the people, but affected my life. And there's 43 other stories that are yet to be told of the 43 other passengers and how their lives got changed. The, um, I met the daughter of the pilot. She flew out for my book launch. And her story is a lot different than mine. Totally different. You want to hear how different? Yes. United Airlines wrote, because he was a pilot, wrote her mother a check for a million dollars. Wow. That was a lot of money. Yeah. And her mom was wise and invested in businesses. So she never had to worry a day in her life. Only a couple families tried suing my mom. Um, Philco tried to get, hire the best lawyers in Philadelphia, City United Airlines, and couldn't because there's no law on the books that they had to inspect the luggage. See, if they'd only inspected the luggage, they would have found the 25 6 of dynamite that blew up the plane, and the man, when he confessed, he wanted to blow up and kill his mother. So he put the issue the bomb in the suitcase to kill his mother and he could have cared less about the 43 other passengers. So it was a national disaster. The whole nation was on it. President Eisenhower had two people on that flight. It, um, every paper in the country would have covered it and all eyes were on it. And back then justice was much swifter. They caught the man they only charge him with one count of murder because it was quicker and swifter than proving that he wanted to intentionally kill all his predecessors would have seen. That's understandable. They got pushed under he got pushed under the rug nationally. When all the bombings were happening in the nineties, and at least in Ohio, the news would recount some of the history of these tragedies. They never went back to November first, nineteen fifty five. Mm. And it was the first ever plane bombing over U.S. soil. Mm. But I'm here today to tell you another good story out of this. Had I not come to grips with the forgiveness factor, I could not have ever come to Well County. I never could have come to be Conrad. That's not correct. I couldn't have done it. But because my husband and I came out in 2022 after the pandemic lift happened, <laughs> so when we came out, due to a Rick Salinger, CBS for it, it was the one documentary I saw and helping me write my book, it was one of the sources. I contacted him from him. He put me in touch with Rick Tittle, he's behind, raise your hand, <laughs> 2019. Rick Tittle's story is he was seven years old when his mom drove him by the beet field and told him the whole story. And he's been gripped with this, that something needs to be done, there needs to be a memorial, there needs to be something done about this. And so we hooked up and we began talking, and because of him, his urging, you gotta come, you gotta come, Marion, is when I came, and because of Conrad, he knew Conrad, and he connected us with Conrad and the rest of the story. I've met so many wonderful people in the area from Greeley. Um, 2022, I went to the State Armory in Greeley. The part of the story is that Greeley State Armory pitched in and they, they became the morgue. Once the FBI could identify the bodies, uh, they were then uh, carried off to the morgue, into a makeshift morgue at State Armory. Event Center. I would recommend touring it for anyone. It's, it's full of history. And the guy there will give you a tour. I'm going to tell you the whole story about the whole phenomenal historical place. Um, but I, I wouldn't be here today to be able to do this. And what happened um, in 2022, I came back because as I was writing my book and researching what did happen that night in Well County, I saw something that no other documentary saw. 
I saw what no other author like Mainline or Denver didn't pick up on it. I saw the American spirit I had never seen before. I saw average, everyday American heroes rallying at time of disaster, doing what they had to do to get it done. And the job went on for years to clean up a mess. And the first month afterwards, I just learned from Conrad, is there's teams of about 150 people on the fields every single day combing for any debris, combing for anything. So these are the heroes, the legacy that Well County has, because what the citizens did 70 years ago is amazing, and every new resident needs to hear the story of the bravery and the courage. Because as I shared in 22, 2022, I spoke at five town halls, because I wanted, I didn't know how to thank the communities, and uh, so Johnstown Town Hall clerk said, Mary, you can do presentations at every town hall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was just going to do a YouTube. Hey, I'm standing in front of Johnson Town Hall. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> I didn't know how to do it. She told me, so I, I um, in the time frame that we could come, I had time for five town halls. Spoke at five town hall meetings, Firestone, Platteville, Johnstown, Mead, and Longmont and that publicly thanked their communities, what they did 70 years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, to be honest, you could hear a pin drop because mayors are used to people coming and complaining. <laughs> and I was coming and thanking. And that's what got me started here. And, there, and um, as Conrad, I think, It's time to bring Conrad, Conrad. There is, if there's a completion to this story. See, I, I call it my ultimate healing. I've called it my ultimate healing ever since that day I forgave the man. All that bitterness, everything left. Everything got restored. <coughs> but there is even more healing out of this. It's like God is taking ashes and turning it into beauty. In our lives, my sister is her first time out here. Her first time meeting Conrad, <coughs> meeting all the fine people in Well County. And um, why don't you tell your story of what happened when I met you or what you want to say. Okay, thank you, Mary. <coughs> different in every story that's true. Why I couldn't talk about this for my family. <coughs> And so, I don't know what the word is. Dramatic. Dramatic. Yeah. My uh, father, my brother, my girlfriend at the time, and myself were all involved in picking up finding and picking up bodies from the airplane, which was a couple days uh, job. You want me to sit down? Yeah, I think you better. I okay. feel better. I feel better if you did. I think Martha would feel better if you did. <laughs> Take care of those old people. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the bodies were scattered helter skelter over 160 200 acres of ground except for the cockpit which landed when marion said quite a ways from the tail and there was parts of the plane all scattered throughout that area on farmland and in the river bottom and we had to what is true find the bodies and we had to pick them up so they could be taken to the morgue. The cockpit actually burned in excess of two days for months in fuel with the bodies of the pilots still inside it. So you know it was probably the third day when we were able to get the bodies out of the cockpits. 
I remember picking up those bodies with one person said, picking up these bodies is like picking up seven foot of jello and trying to put it in a paper sack because every bone was crushed from the compaction with the ground. That's one reason we can't talk about the bodies and the conditions they were in. And I won't say any more than that, but I thank Marion because I was so obsessed and whatever confused that all I ever thought about was the bodies and what the hell they went through until she told me about her life of being raised without a real father and the things she had to go through. And then I remember, then I realized that these people only suffered for a few meets in a heartbeat. And there are people that have suffered for years and years and maybe through a whole lifetime that needed to have our compassion there needs to be a memorial just for these families. That needs to be displayed where people know their names. I feel there will be a memorial someday, maybe not in my lifetime, but if you could help support us to get a memorial, it'd be appreciated. But another thing is, if not, just say a prayer for these families. Thank you. Okay, stay here. I copy that. Yeah, Most of the time I can't. <laughs> Sorry. You did. No, I love you. This this is so cool. When I met him in 2022, I I was with fear and trepidation. It took me months to want to call him because I was afraid he wouldn't want to hear from me. I was afraid of what he was going to say or what I was going to say, or what he was. I didn't know it, it, what his response would be. I didn't want to upset him. But beauty came out of this. When we came out in 2022, you went, CBS interviewed me, ABC7 did, a re local reporters came out on the fields. He went three times with me to the fields. And one time, I, I really thanked him. I knew it was our last time seeing him. I thanked him for all he did. And what did you tell me? I don't remember now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. He told me, thank you, Mary, and you brought much healing to me. And I was taken back by that. That was like awe-inspiring. And then recently, last few weeks in planning this trip and seeing how he was doing, catching up on news, he told me more, more specifics of what's hap what happened on those wheat fields. But he said one thing that really struck me. He said, Marion, for 66 years, because up to 2022 was 66 years, I was haunted by what happened on the fields. Right? Yep. But after I came, it, Did really you say? Me. it didn't soak in right away, it took time. But eventually, I realized that all of my thoughts about the people and the hell I went through to get killed on the plane only lasted for a, a heartbeat or two. Their problems and everything where people actually had years and maybe a lifetime of suffering because of the evil thing a person has done. We never ever, family-wise, talked about it until the 50th anniversary when the reporters started coming and uh, my, my kids said, Dad, you've never told us about that crash. I said, I never want to talk about that crash. And that's brought a lot of things back. And it's just been the last maybe three years, I would say, that my memory is bringing back things that it's going to be subconsciously hidden that happened after working at that site for 30 days. 
I'm mm -hmm. sure I could tell you 30 different stories, but it, it's terrible. But what, what he told me was that his haunting stopped. So it just wasn't healing for him. My coming, I, I was just me, okay? Not super spiritual, not super any person, you know, coming. And I had no idea, you know, when he told me in 2022 it was healing for him, I thought it was healing for me, more resolution for me. When you told me that the haunting stopped, that took it a little deeper level. And this is the beauty out of this whole story. And I just love you, love you to life. Thank, thank you for having courage to come meet me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, you all have a wonderful heritage here. And there's many, many stories. I'm collecting stories. And if any of you know of any stories, I have a flyer there. You, and on the email list, you'll keep in touch with me. But let me know specifically if you or family members know of stories. Um, I know there's a Virginia Hope Bay at Bert, Bertho, because of the, the uh, articles coming out about this, about me coming. She contacted me. She's 85 years old. She's going to come to Longmont, the evening of Longmont. She was 15 years old at the time, and she told me her story. She also told me her story about her friends, family. And her friends, her friend and her, and her friend's parents there, the family, was eating at the Stapleton restaurant where people would go and they'd watch the plane sing yeah. They were there the night, November 1st. And after it all went down, they realized they saw the killer. And because they said there was a young gentleman just pacing up and down, pacing up and down, getting up nervously, looking out the window, because that's recorded, that's what he did. But this other family, local family here, actually saw him. But of course, obviously didn't know what had happened because no one knew for a couple weeks. So then they put two and you get us. So that's one of the stories. There are, as he said, hundreds, because there, you said close to 500. I said 200, you said 500. I'll tell you, there were so many, in 20 minutes, there were so many people. They, they tore down our fences. They got high centered in the fields where the irrigation ditches separated one field from another. Yeah. Thank God it was dark, but they couldn't find those bodies because if you found a body, you stayed with it because of the pilfers that were actually stealing parts from the body. Oh, and you, you had to stay with them. That was the first night, and I, and I thank God that it was dark, and the bodies were scattered over uh, 200 acres of ground. The one that was the farthest away was the child, about a quarter of a mile on another farm called the Lang property. And the cockpit with the pilots inside was on the Heil property, just over the fence line uh, from our property. And I don't remember exactly because I didn't see all of the bodies. We didn't have time. My father, my brother, and, and my girlfriend, who now has been my wife for 67 years, were, were busy, uh, yeah. were busy uh, trying to pick these bodies up and, and get them to the makeshift morgue in Greeley, Colorado. Yeah, so I'm forever grateful, my sister and I are, for what these citizens did. I have tried locating the other families of the victims. I managed to find, well actually she found me, the daughter of the pilot found me, and we're good friends. She lives in Seattle though. And um, 